So thank you for coming out on this rainy evening. Manchester has done us proud as usual. Um, thank you for coming to the event called Guantanamo and the Legal Battle Against Torture, a, a talk given by Professor Lisa Hajar of University of California, Santa Barbara. This is a joint event between HCRI and Manchester International Law Centre. It's hybrid and it's being recorded so you can listen to it again if you wish. I want to give some thanks to um, our people from the International Law Centre, Ian Scobie and Gail Lisko, um, and of course Andrew Gibson from HCRI for organising this event. And also to Professor Hajar for making her way all the way from sunny California to be with us here tonight. So this talk is based on uh, Professor Hajar's new book, which has just been published by University of California Press called The War and Court Inside the Long War and the Long Fight Against Torture. And you can actually get this book with a 20% discount if you go to Lisa Hajar's um, uh, Twitter account, which is at Lisa Hajar. And the pinned tweet at the top is for a 20% discount. So you can go there and get that. Now in the book, Professor Hajar traces how hundreds of lawyers mobilized to challenge the legal treatment of prisoners captured in the war on terror and help to force an end to the United States government's most odious policies. She shows how these lawyers brought the war on terror into the courts and their victories, though few and far between, forced the United States government to change the way prisoners were treated. If it was not for these lawyers and their allies, US torture would have gone unchallenged because elected officials and the American public, with a few exceptions, did nothing to oppose it. This war on court has been fought to defend the principle that there's no legal right to torture. Now, this is a book that's been 20 years in the making. Lisa will start by telling you about her journey. Um, in her introduction, she talks about how she anticipated in the aftermath of the terrorist attacks of 9-11 that the United States would turn to torture. And she subsequently interviewed hundreds of lawyers and legal activists and traveled to Guantanamo Bay herself 14 times, the only social scientist to do so um, in order to write about these military commissions. Now, Professor Hajar works on the sociology of law and, and conflict, human rights and political violence. Her current research, as you'll hear tonight, focuses on the US war on terror especially around the issue of torture, targeted killing, and Guantanamo. She's also the author of Courting Conflict, the Israeli military court system in the West Bank and Gaza. And that's where I first uh, came into uh, contact with Lisa's work. And she also is the author of Torture, a Sociology of Violence and Human Rights. Her journalistic writing has been published by The Nation, Al Jazeera, Middle East Report and Jodalia. Now I'm going to hand over to Professor Hajar now, who's going to talk for about 30 to 40 minutes, and then we'll open up for contributions from the audience here and the audience online. And Professor Ian Scobie will chair the QA. Thank you very much for coming. Lisa. Thank you. Thank you. I am going to put my book cover on. I think it's this. Okay just so you can see what it looks like. Um, okay, so thank you so much for uh, having me in Manchester. This is actually my first time in Manchester and unfortunately my, I have less than 24 hours here, but when your weather is better and my schedule is looser, I hope to come back again to Manchester. So as Mandy had said, uh, Mandy and I know each other, uh, we've known each other for years, but Mandy and I were together uh, for a year when I, we, I was on sabbatical, Mandy had taken a leave and um, I was started writing the book at that time. And it was a, one of the, it was the greatest idea any human being ever had. It was called Sabbatical at Seas. And we just like went from island to island, like writing about torture and scuba diving. Um, anyway, so the, as Mandy had mentioned, you know, when, um, I mean, I had been thinking about torture a lot way before, I mean, the way sometimes I say, you know, lots of people became uh, very interested in torture because the U.S. government became a torturing regime. 
you know, in the um, in context of the war on terror. But I had been thinking about torture before it was cool, as I used, sometimes would joke with my students that because my first, um, my when I was a graduate student, my dissertation, and then it became my first book, was on the Israeli military court system in the West Bank and Gaza. And so when I had um, gone and started my research uh, in the very at the very beginning of the 1990s, you know, on the Israeli military court system, I thought I was going to be studying Israeli and Palestinian nationalisms just happened to be in this court system. But I learned, I mean, as one would hope one does when, when you're a graduate student, I learned so much. Uh, one of the things that really sort of set my career on the trajectory that it has been on was I came to realize that torture, Israeli torture of Palestinians was absolutely central to the way in which Israel's control over the occupied territories manifested, particularly, you know, through, up, up till, you know, around 2000. And the reason for that was because Palestinians would be arrested and then, you know, coercively uh, interrogated, you know, to get confessions. The confessions were virtually unchallengeable. Those confessions would become the basis for charges, prosecution in the military courts and conviction. And in the at the turn of the 1990s, Israel had the largest per capita um, uh, in, incarceration rate in the world at the time. So it was a very big, so I really realized how central torture was. But the other important lesson that I really learned and I've you know, greatly appreciated from Israeli and Palestinian lawyers was in the context of political conflicts, when 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 certain aspects of conflicts get legalized, and you know, there's the humanitarian uh, humanitarianism is oftentimes thinking about the ways in which conflicts may raise legal issues. Lawyers have a very special role to play. I mean, oftentimes political issues become legal issues. And so if, um, for example, governments, like in the case, you know, going back to my early, my first research project, where it was, um, you know, it would be both Israeli and Palestinian human rights lawyers challenging government lawyers on the terrain of law over not only the torture of Palestinians, but the different the ways in which uh, the court system operated, et cetera. And so those things were very significant um, sort of shaping my interests and my expertise in, throughout the 1990s. But the other, and since I am here in the, in the United Kingdom, the other thing that really just further intensified my interest and fascination with torture was the arrest of Augusto Pinochet in um, London in 1998. He was, uh, he was the former dictator of Chile, uh, for those of you who don't know, and he had come to have his prostate examined and have tea with Margaret Thatcher. And while he was in London, uh, the, um, a Spanish judge issued an arrest warrant saying we want you, the British government to send Pinochet to Spain to stand, tor stand trial for uh, murder and torture that he had perpetrated or abetted while he was during the, um, the military dictatorship in Chile. And so what happened was the House of Lords that used to be the thing you had before the Supreme Court. <laughs> I just found out actually that there's now a Supreme Court and you know, bravo people. Um, but the, uh, so the House of Lords like sort of looked at the charges that the Spanish judge wanted to prosecute Pinochet for. And they said, well, you know, he can't be, pro you know, murder is not an extraditable offense because, you know, the regime was engaged in a war on subversion and killing people in war is perfectly normal and rational. And that's what wars are about. But there is no sovereign immunity for torture. And so the law lords of Britain said Pinochet would have been um, extraditable to Spain to stand trial. And that was considered a major turning point. That was, um, you know, the Pinochet precedent. But uh, then the British government decided for political reasons not to send him there. But the, one of the things that became so crucial that this Pinochet case uh, really altered the way in which international criminal law was thought about and imagined. The criminal doctrine that, uh, you know, the Spanish judge had used was something that had not been used for almost a century, it, you know, it was called universal jurisdiction, and that it had basically that jurisdiction had been invented to deal with pirates and slave traders. 
and then it had fallen into disuse with the decline of the maritime world. And so uh, it was dusted off for Pinochet, and it's now become a very significant way of prosecuting people in courts. In, in like, the, the principle of universal jurisdiction, it only attaches to the most serious crimes torture, genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. But the argument is that people who are, perpetrate those crimes are enemies of all mankind. And if they are not prosecuted in the country where the crime occurred or their own country, there's the principle of universal jurisdiction that they can be prosecuted in another country because it's the whole world's interest to see people prosecuted. And so universal jurisdiction um, kind of is a looming uh, thing in terms of what happened in, in the United States and uh, you know after 9-11. So the 9-11 terrorist attacks occur, and then just within days and weeks, you know, some of the things that U.S. officials in the George W. Bush administration were saying, and particularly Vice President Dick Cheney, um, you know, they were making statements in the media and, you know, having spent like a decade thinking about torture, both in the Israeli context, et cetera, I was hearing like what they call dog whistles, you know, like the Cheney was talking about, we're going to take gloves off, we're going to use every means at our disposal, et cetera. And it, I, I anticipated that the U.S. government was going to embark on, you know, a torture uh, regime. And indeed, but it was, you know, it was a secret for several years. I mean, the United States did, in fact, embark on a torture regime. And I just want to say a few things about how that came about before I then talk about the fight against torture. So, and I hope I don't get too into the weeds on, um, you know, U.S. politics, but Dick Cheney, um, is a, like a very right wing. I mean, you know, they're all right wing, but like he's a particularly right wing kind of a guy. And he had come into the vice presidency with a long, um, uh, you know, political resentment of the kind of legal and political reforms that were instituted in the United States after the Watergate scandal, after the Vietnam War, after it was revealed that the FBI had been spying on civil rights leaders, et cetera. A lot of new restrictions in the 1970s had been instituted to curb those kind of executive excesses. Cheney hated that. He wanted to restore the power of the presidency. And so when he and a small group of radical right-wing lawyers who were close to him, government lawyers, his own legal counsel, David Addington, there was a guy, I don't know, for some of you who may have followed this, you know, John Yu was a lawyer in, at the time in the Office of Legal Counsel, which is an office within the Justice Department. It's called the government's lawyer. So this small band of right-wing lawyers basically had the idea that they wanted to implement. And the 9-11 terrorist attacks and the start, the declaration, the start of a global war on terror gave them the opportunity to institute what they called, or what was guiding them was this idea of the unitary executive thesis. And the unitary executive thesis is this right-wing interpretation of a particular article in the US Constitution it's, it's it's not actually how the Constitution should be interpreted. It's just how crazy right wingers interpret it. But the um, it was basically the idea that the president's power cannot be fettered by law or courts or Congress when he's acting in the interests of national security. And so Cheney had been like chomping at the bit for two decades, waiting for the opportunity to institute something like this. And then you get 9-11 attacks and the start of a war on terror. And that's what they did. And so basically... You know, Cheney and the small group of lawyers really um, led what they, they created something, what they called the new paradigm. And what the new paradigm was, was basically saying pre the president's powers are unfettered. He can make policies, make decisions, and he's not bound by any laws. He's not going to be bound by the Geneva Conventions. He's not going to be bound by federal oversight laws, et cetera. So it was like expanded executive power and you know, these guys, none of them had served in the military. So they're like, ah, the Geneva Conventions, how quaint, how old fashioned. We can fight this war outside of the bounds of the Geneva Conventions. 
you know, and so, and that was basically, I mean, they, they were coming up with these ideas even before there were any people taken into custody. You know, this is like, they were coming up with this in the early fall of 2001. But the problem was, and this is where, you know, part of the story that I tell in my book, you know, I mean, like I cover a lot of uh, territory in this book, but they, these lawyers who really took control of policy making and the justifications, and they essentially legalized torture. They legal they, they they reinterpreted the law. And by saying legalized, it doesn't make, mean they made it legal. They just offered up interpretation secretly at the time, you know, to enable coercive interrogations, kidnapping, forced disappearance, etc. Those were the things that they did. You know, and they just didn't realize that the Geneva Conventions are not just some quaint, you know, Thing that, you know, but they were actually their federal law and they bind uh, the U.S. military, uh, you know, they're applicable to the U.S. military. So all of this, you know, by way of I'm sort of setting the story, President Bush, um, you know, on November 13th, 2001, President Bush issues a military order. It was actually written by Cheney's uh, counsel, David Addington. And this was the order that really set the, the sort of the course for the torture policy and all other kinds of things. He basically said, anybody whom I decide is, you know, engage in international terrorism, that would be meaning anybody that might be arrested or picked up. Afghanistan was the first place where the war on terror starts. Anybody who'd be picked up would have no right to challenge their detention or their treatment in any court anywhere. So he was basically saying that this that, that that he was decreeing the right to hold people incommunicado without status review tribunals, et cetera, and that those um, that you know the government would the U.S. government would decide to prosecute could be prosecuted in these new military commissions that were invented just for this purpose, and these military commissions would not really bear much resemblance to courts of law. And so it was, that was a first like red light. So these, now I've sort of talked about all the bad guys. Now we start talking about at least the people who become heroic and, or at least, you know, uh, play very significant roles that I focus on. One of them, and sort of the first person I, you know, would credit for the fight against torture was someone named uh, Michael Ratner. And he was the executive director mm -hmm. of this left, uh, left-leaning um, you know, legal advocacy organization called the Center for Constitutional Rights based in New York City. And when Ratner heard Bush's, about Bush's military order, the idea that the president was just throwing 200 years of tradition out the window and decreeing unto himself all kinds of power, he you know, was quite concerned. But what really uh, concerned um, Ratner and what triggered the beginning of the fight against torture was when the Bush administration selected Guantanamo as the site for long-term interrogation and detention. And Guantanamo was selected for several reasons. One, these right-wing lawyers, not the brightest crayons in the box, but they were pulling all the levers. They imagined that Guantanamo, which the U.S. naval base on the south side of Cuba, um, which has been in U.S. control since 1903, they imagined that this, this naval base, 100% under U.S. control, but not sovereign to the United States, that somehow if they, you know, selected this site for long-term interrogation, detention, it would be outside of the reach of U.S. ports. That was why, and then the other reason is because it's close to the continental United States. And so Guantanamo was selected in Dece on December 26, 2001, and the first people, you know, the first 20 people who've been captured in Afghanistan get shipped to uh, Guantanamo on January 11th, 2002. And the reason why this was significant in terms of Michael Ratner, Ratner and, another, and a group of lawyers in the 1990s had fought the George H.W. Bush and the Bill Clinton administrations because Guantanamo had been used to hold, you know, uh, Haitians who were fleeing political violence in Haiti. They were like taken to Guantanamo and they were held in absolutely horrific conditions. And when these first war on terror detainees arrive uh, in Guantanamo, Michael, you know, the Pentagon was thought that it was Americans would celebrate pictures of these 
people like bound in painful positions, wearing you know, sensory deprivation gear. They were in the same sites where the Haitians had been. So Ratner basically said, you know, and you have to think of one thing. New, you know, the Center for Constitutional Rights was in New York City. This is like two, three, four months after 9-11. I mean, the city was still uncovering dead bodies out of the World Trade Center. So it was quite a, you know, sort of leap of, you know, whatever to, you know, actually think that he would going to take on the president over this policy so soon after 9-11. And the lawyers who joined him, one of them is a British American citizen named Clive Stafford Smith. Um, and then, um, you know, another lawyer, a death penalty lawyer from the United States, who's American, Joe Margulis, and a couple of other people. And so they basically filed, I mean, they found the names of a couple of people, because first of all, Whoever was at Guantanamo, the government regarded that as classified information. But the names of a few people who were citizens of allied countries was it got known. So one of them was a guy named David Hicks, who was an Australian citizen. And then the the, the three other people that um, Ratner learned the names of were there. You know, they've been called the Tipton Three. It was three young British guys from Tipton, England: um, Rasul, Ahmed, and Ekbal. I think that's their last names. I mean, you know, so anyway, so what the and the, so Ratner got permission from the families of Hicks and the Tipton three to file habeas petitions. So this was where, you know, in other words, habeas corpus is um, the notion, it's like the ancient right. It's like the common law right that, you know, no sovereign is allowed to secretly detain people. And so habeas corpus literally means show us the body. You know, that's the old, you know, it, it dates back to King Henry II and the Assize of Clarendon in 1106. Uh, but anyway, so, you know, they filed this case in February of 2002, challenging, and it was really quite a significant thing, the challenging, uh, um, you know, pr the president's authority to secretly detain people without charge or trial. And that was the question that this case raised. Um, and, you know, not surprisingly, you know, there, there's a line where, um, you know, and I, this really became so clear to me when I was, you know, doing my book. There were a couple of important times when U.S. courts kind of rose to the challenge, not, and really you can, you could count them on one hand, but it's, you know, sort of when you're asking these kind of unprecedented questions, it's like that Monty Python line, like you never saw the Inquisition coming, you know, like who, who would have expected the Inquisition? It's kind of like who would have expected that the government, that the U.S. government would, you know, authorize a policy like this. So the courts, being courts were un, you know, not particularly well suited to deal with it. So the Rasul v. Bush case loses in the lower court, loses on appeal, and then it gets um, goes to the Supreme Court. And surprisingly, the Supreme Court accepted to hear this case. And so this, the, the, there's, I mean, I'm just going to talk about like just very briefly two sort of significant cases that you know in the U.S. system, and then I'll end up with the 9/11 case. But so. You know, the, the Supreme Court was hearing um, oral arguments in April of 2004. And then what happens? And I call this, like, so the case is Rasul v. Bush. They was called, you know, it was Rasul v. Bush. And, and um, so, as I would say, like, the road to Rasul, the Supreme Court decision, passes through Abu Ghraib. And so on April 28, 2004, you know, the United States invaded Iraq in 2003. It was kind of like the idea of expanding the war on terror beyond Afghanistan. And, um, you know, so what happens is on April 28, 2004, an American uh, news program broadcasts horrific photos of, of prisoners being tortured by U.S. soldiers in the Abu Ghraib prison in Iraq. And, you know, I mean, so this was, you know, those pictures go public, they um, create a global scandal. But the critical thing in terms of the fight against torture was that the pressure that that scandal put on the Bush administration forced 
finally, you know, we're talking about 2004, this is several years into what's going on, forced the administration to start releasing some materials, legal documents, policy documents about, you know, what, what was going on in U.S. detention facilities. And so these documents come out, are, are le a small handful of them are released in um, June, of, early June of 2004. And that ladies and gentlemen, was like, I mean, the, the photos were horrific, but the memos were instantly, um, uh, you know, turn, called the torture memos, because what they revealed, like all the secrets that have been going on for several years, was that the U.S., the Bush administration had a policy of torture that had been authorized by the top, by the president, by the vice president, by the secretary of defense, and all these um, policies were varnished with legal opinions by government lawyers. And so that, you know, was, I mean, you know, lots of people, you would say a picture, um, you know, is worth a thousand words. But when you're talking about lawyers, like a legal memo is worth, it's worth at least a thousand words. And so when those torture memos came out in early June, and then the Supreme Court issues its ruling in Rasul v. Bush on June 26th, I think, 2004, and lo and behold, Michael Ratner and CCR won and the Bush administration lost. The Supreme Court said, you can't secretly detain people. They have the right to challenge their detention in, um, in federal court. And it was the confluence of the Abu Ghraib um, photos, the torture memos, that hundreds of American lawyers were so pissed off at what was happening, what the government had done in, you know, like to the law, et cetera, that, you know, right after that um, decision came down, first dozens and then hundreds of American lawyers from all walks of the profession, Democrats and Republicans, corporate lawyers, human rights lawyers, family lawyers, vol <clears throat> excuse me, volunteered to serve as habeas counsel for Guantanamo detainees. So that becomes like this major push in, you know, the fight against torture. I'm going to, you know, I'm happy to answer questions. Like that's, you know, there's a whole lot to say there, but of course I wrote a whole book about that. I can't say it all. But the other really um, fascinating thing that I was really, especially for someone like me to learn was, you know, there was another track of legal, you know, kind of virtuousness or heroicism. And it was, you know, a corner that like someone, like I'm a, you know, a lefty with no, you know, the United States has a um, volunteer army. I never really had much contact with people in the U.S. military, um, you know, before this. But milit a small handful of military lawyers, when the, when the Bush administration decided to start lining up a, the first couple of Guantanamo detainees to prosecute in this new military commission system, the, you know, it was one of the biggest miscalculations on the part of, you know, the, 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 the decision makers in the Bush administration. They assumed American soldiers are innately right wing. American soldiers will always obey their orders and American soldiers were going to hate Muslims. And so when these defense lawyers, you know, these military lawyers who were assigned to defend the first few um, detainees, and they start thinking about what's actually is what what's the rules for this military commissions, and and how are these people that we're supposed to defend um, have how they've been treated in U.S. custody, um, and and you know on top of that they were ordered, they were ordered to plead their clients guilty. Like the first five you know or so that were assigned, the the military lawyers were saying plead these guys guilty because the Bush administration thought. If they could get a couple of quick convictions through plea bargains, they could, you know, you know, prove to the world that the military commissions were an effective tool in the war on terror. Well, as it happened, these military lawyers basically were like, we are lawyers. You know, we are lawyers and lawyers have a certain ethical standards and we're soldiers and it is, you know, goes against the U.S. It's not the purpose of the military to be used like puppets for a political purpose. And so these handful of lawyers, um, you know, actually fought the, the Pentagon over these things. And so the, the significant case there was, um, you know, one of the military defense lawyers is a guy named Lieutenant Commander Charles Swift. And his client was named Salim Hamdan. Hamdan was a Yemeni, um, you know, who got gone, you know, just to, to uh, Afghanistan in the 19, in the mid 1990s. Ended up getting a job as Osama bin Laden's driver. 
you know, so like not actually like the top of the Al Qaeda food chain. Anyway, so Salim Hamdan is charged. Charlie Swift is his lawyer, and Swift. Uh, you know, teams up with a Georgetown University law professor named Neil Katyal, and they basically decide to sue Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld over the unconstitutionality of the military commissions. And so that that, that case, Hamdan v. Rumsfeld, was a second, you know, again, not very many cases, but that was a biggie. And um, when that case I mean, basically, it was saying that, you know, the president doesn't the, the challenge was that the president doesn't have the right to just create military commissions by fiat, which he had done in his November 2001 military order. But but more importantly, the decision to disregard the Geneva Conventions is, you know, it's unacceptable because the Geneva Conventions govern how the U.S. military in its entirety operates. And so when that case was decided in uh, June of 2006, once again, this is a second, and there are not very many, but the Bush administration lost again. And the Hamdan v. Rumsfeld case was a game change was I mean if, if the Rasul case was a game changer for opening up Guantanamo to lawyers, the Hamdan case was a, a, a game changer because as I would say in the book, it's like it killed the torture program, although it was deprived of a proper burial. The Supreme Court both said this, you know, the, the, the military commissions are unconstitutional, but the real finger in the eyes, uh, you know, to the administration was they said, common article three of the Geneva Conventions, which is considered the humanitarian baseline, which prohibits torture, cruel treatment, and outrages of human dignity, applies to everybody in US custody. And that actually meant also the people who were being uh, secret, had been kidnapped and forcibly disappeared into CIA black sites because the CIA was running a whole separate torture program from the military. And so in September of 2006, Bush, you know, the Bush administration, you know, George Bush gives a press conference. He complains about the Supreme Court, like overstepping its bounds and tying the hands of the executive and trying to keep America safe. But he, for the first time, acknowledges the existence of the CIA's torture program. He doesn't say call it torture. He calls it alternative techniques, you know, that they were using. And he, like, lays the groundwork for lies. You know, this program was legal. This program saved lives. This program produced lots of excellent um, intelligence. All of that was bullshit and lies. But we only learn about that much later. But so with the, with the CIA uh, black sites closed, the CIA had had about 119 people at any, you know, over the span of its um, time. But they decided that there were 14 people who were in black sites that the government was, okay, so we can't keep them in black sites forever. Let's bring them to Guantanamo and try them. And one of them was the alleged mastermind of 9-11, Khalid Mohammed, and a few other people. So they bring 14 uh, detainees from the black sites to Guantanamo. Um, you know, and then just to say, you know, although the Supreme Court had canceled the military commissions, Congress was controlled by Republicans in 2006. So Congress gives back to the Bush administration what the Supreme Court had taken away. They create, they pass the Military Commissions Act, recreating the commissions, and they do something absolutely horrible, which was they basically, aside from you know, uh, do, you know, reversing the Supreme Court, they put in. Um, like an element which remains law of the land in the United States, basically saying um, that for those of you who are law students, this won't be confusing. Like they, they, the law wrote in ex post facto immunity for war crimes going back to 1997, because everything, all the torture that had been done, but whether by the military or by the CIA, that's war crimes. And so Congress actually immunized U.S. officials. And that in and of itself is a war crime. So that's you know part of the you start getting all these things. But so I'm not going to talk too much. I just want to like sort of end up with what happened because there's so many things that that happened. But with these 14 people, you know, 14 former CIA prisoners brought to um, Guantanamo, five of them, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and four others who are accused 
of playing various roles in the 9-11 terrorist attacks. And so, but let me just say one thing about them. So since they had been in CIA custody, like they were, you know, picked up between 2002 and 2004, um, you know, and they will disappear. And what the CIA does, I mean, the CIA in general operates in secret. It, like the CIA is unaccountable in ways that any other, that no other institution has that kind of unaccountability. Well, the CIA owns information about itself. So these guys who had spent years being tortured by CIA agents in black sites knew secret information. It was basically like what the CIA did to them was a was a secret. And so the CIA, you know, basically regarded their memories as classified. And so you get these this effort. First, the Bush administration attempts to prosecute them. The Bush administration, again, drinking its own Kool-Aid, was convinced that, you know, uh, they could be charged in. Um, they were charged in uh, arraigned or charged in, in 2007, but they're arraigned in June 2008. This is the, the last year of Bush Bush's presidency. They thought going to arraign them, going to you know charge them going to prosecute them, get guilty verdicts, execute them by the time Bush leaves office at the end of 2008. What, what happened was that the five of them, um, you know, basically decided at that point, you know, they made it, they, they made a statement to the judge in December of 2008 saying, we're all willing to plead guilty on one condition, that we go directly to execution. So they basically wanted to do suicide or, you know, martyrdom by military commission. But, you know, the Brainiacs who made the laws for the military commissions hadn't anticipated that one. Case falls apart. Then Mr. Liberal, Barack Obama gets elected. And, you know, he, I mean, Obama, you know, for all the hundreds of lawyers who are now involved in different ways fighting, you know, the torture program, habeas councils like Guantanamo, military lawyers, people, you know, probe, you know, uh, suing the government for information, all kinds of, you know, efforts to, um, you know, try and prosecute U.S. torturers and see, provide um, justice for victims. So many people who were involved in this, you know, the, in the long fight against torture were really, and myself included, were very enthusiastic about Barack Obama. I mean, he was, he had campaigned on a promise to end torture, restore the rule of law, right the ship of state, et cetera. And then on his first full day in office, he did, he, he took the CIA out of the torture business. He basically canceled U.S. torture. He suspended, would not canceling the military commissions, and he um, promised to close Guantanamo within a year. Spoiler alert: Guantanamo is still open. Um, you know, so the you know originally Obama really thought that you know he could just you know his administration could really you know uh, fix everything, and so the first plan. But, but Obama did decide to keep on using the military commissions, you know, because for whatever, I mean, I can explain why, but but the, the original plan for the 9-11 guys, because this 9-11 case becomes, like you have the 9-11 suspects now at Guantanamo, the 9-11 case, that was the reason the war on terror, that case became like the be all and end all of whether or not anything the US government had done over you know, those two administrations and now two administrations since would be worthwhile. So originally Obama, the Obama administration wanted to process, to bring the five 9-11 suspects to New York and prosecute them in federal court. But then Fox News had a hissy fit and all the right wing Republicans, you know, started crying and screaming that Obama was like soft on terrorism and Obama being Obama, basically like, said, okay, we're not going to do that. So then they, you know, recharged these guys, the five 9-11 guys in um, the military commissions. They were recharged in 2011. The case begins in 2012. It's 2022. That case has not moved past pretrial hearings. And, and so that's really most of the cases that most of the um, times I've been to Guantanamo were, I go as a journalist, is to observe the military commission case for the 9-11. So going to Guantanamo over years for weeks at a time, really, and you know, being a sociologist, but I'm sort of posing like a journalist. I mean, I do write journalistically, but I was <laughs> thinking like, a, and I could really come to understand what was going on with this and, and the, the significance of torture. So from 2012 until about 2017, 
most of the hearings, I mean, there's lots of every single thing had to be litigated in the military commissions. Like if one of the defendants thought he was hearing hallucinatory sounds, that would have to be because these guys were, you know, their, their memories and their everything about them was classified because they knew CIA secrets. But for the first, um, I'm really bad at math, 2012 and 17, that's five years. For the first five years, that was, um, it was primarily like the five teams of defense lawyers, because each of these guys had its own team, like a death penalty lawyer, a military lawyer, and then other people. It was mostly a fight for information, right? This is a death penalty case. And so these were skilled death penalty lawyers. And they were like, in a death penalty case, how the government treated somebody prior to them being charged is legally relevant. But what the government had done to these guys was done by the CIA and it was a secret. And so just year after year, fight after fight, and the prosecutors, the prosecution was carrying water for the CIA. So the prosecution would like dole out little bits of information, but then, and the government was constantly spying on the defense teams, like spying on that. So you're thinking like, how are you even gonna have a, like how do we even fantasize that's anything that looks anything like this could be, um, you know, remotely, uh, you know, appear legal to anyone. But so then, I mean, and there's been a lot of, you know, turmoil. And so but the last chapter of my book really focuses on this because it's really like sort of the, the biggest, hardest piece of the much larger and longer fight against torture. But then, you know, around 2018, in 2018, the defense lawyers switched tactics. And they basically, so just to say, what was, the, what was the government's evidence? What was the government, how was the government think it was going to prosecute guys who'd been tortured by the CIA for years? So the government was always saying, the, the government is the prosecutors in this case. They were always saying, we're not going to use any statements that these people made while they were not present in non-dark areas. So what happened was in 2000, after they were brought you know, out of the black sites in 2006, the FBI, so-called FBI clean teams, clean teams were brought in to interrogate these guys in January of 2007. And so the argument was the, CIA, the FBI didn't you know, waterboard them. The FBI didn't stick them in boxes. The FBI didn't like rectally rehydrate them. So you know, they just like sat at a table and asked them some questions. Therefore, whatever these guys said to the FBI in 2007, that's the government's case. Well, you know, these lawyers were really, I mean, year after year studying what happened. And they basically said they were gonna like take, not only take apart the FBI, you know, but they were also, you know, I mean, they were just going to take everything apart. And so they started what they call suppression hearings. And so from September 11th, 2018, you know, until relatively recently, most of the, um, the hearings have been in order to try and prove that if these guys were tortured for years, even if the active waterboarding, rectal rehydration part of the torture is not going on, they've they're not untortured. There is no way that anything they ever said can be not fruit of the poisonous tree. And so the suppression hearings were going on for years and years. And the government was like, we don't care. You know, you, you can say, well, you know, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was waterboarded 283 times. He was only waterboarded 183 times. Like, we don't care. We just, you know, these guys are guilty. But several things happened. And this is now my last point. COVID happened. <laughs> Some of the lawyers got old. Um, and, you know, and so finally, but, but the really the, the absolute thing that, that, you know, made the government kind of sort of throw up its hands in this case was another CIA, a prisoner who'd been in CIA black site, Majid Khan. Majid Khan was another guy who'd been in the black sites and he had agreed back in 2012 to plead guilty to he was in charge he was uh, accused and you know admitted to having you know taken money from Khalid Sheikh Mohammed to fund bombings in Indonesia several bombings in Indonesia so he pl pled guilty um and then because he was willing to testify against the other people in the secret you know camp 7 where all the CIA people were he's literally been in isolation since he since 2012 and so his lawyers arranged 
for his sentencing hearing, which occurred in 2021, one of the things they said was he's pleading guilty, but he wants to be able to make a public statement. And so Majid Khan at his sentencing hearing, which a sentencing hearing meant that there would be like eight military officers. I mean, I, I can, explain. it's just a complicated thing. It's like a Potemkin thing, but he basically, it was the first time somebody who had been tortured by the CIA could speak his truth in his own words. And he apologized for what he had done and he took responsibility and he forgave whoever tortured him. But he then went into rather significant detail about what had happened to him in the black sites. And seven of the eight officers were, so, you know, because like, I guess everybody doesn't read about torture all the time. Can you believe it? <laughs> you know, these people didn't really know a lot about torture, you know, their, these officers. And they went out and, and hand wrote a letter requesting clemency because what the government had done to Majid Khan was so deplorable and despicable. And so the 9-11 prosecutors smelled the coffee and said, we are never ever going to get unanimous guilty verdicts and death sentences for these guys. So they entered into plea bargain negotiations in March 2022. And so I think that all five of them maybe, will, I mean, at least Khalid Sheikh Mohammed will, um, you know, is willing to serve the remainder of his natural life in custody. But now they're negotiating over where, because these guys, they, I mean, you know, ironically, I, mean, I don't know how much any of you know about, you know, you know, prisons in the United States, but they don't want to go to the United States. They'd rather stay at Guantanamo than go to U.S., you know, supermax prisons. And so that's part of what's being negotiated. But the other sticking point is, and this is literally my last point, the other sticking point is that the defense teams, I mean, these guys are damaged. Like they are, some of them have had brain damage from having their heads bashed into walls in the black sites. One person was, you know, sodomized so badly as anal prolapse. Another one is like, you know, half mad. Um, and so the, the defense lawyers want full, impartial medical and psychological treatment for these people. I think they'll plead guilty, but they should be you know, he have given the opportunity that they have never had at Guantanamo. And that's a sticking point. Even now the Biden administration, it's a sticking point because to really allow like psychiatrists or doctors to really treat these people for what ails them, they would have to know what ailed them, what caused the ailments, you know, and that's still a secret. And so that's actually sort of where we are. And I think that, you know, so now Guantanamo, there's only 35 people left, including the 9-11 five. There's about nine, those five and another four on trial. One guy has, you know, been is serving a life sentence. Majid Khan, his sentence is over. He's just waiting for America to find a safe for America place to send him. 20 are um, have been cleared for transfer. Uh, but, you know, the Biden administration hasn't sent them anywhere yet. And then three, including the original guinea pig for the CIA torture program, a guy named Abu Zubaydah, who was never a big wig. The United States assumed he was a big Al Qaeda guy. He wasn't. He's like one of three prisoners they call forever prisoners who has no prospect of trial or uh, or release. And so the United States I mean, these are like the paradoxes and, and the, 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 the products and the legacy of Guantanamo that were built, you know, in the early years, you know, through the manipulations of law. And you just see that it's, it's been impossible to undo those kind of damage. And so Guantanamo remains open. But the real lesson, I think, is that, what the, you know, the 9-11 case in particular really illuminates something that is true. There is no after torture. There is no after torture. Like torture is, a, we, there, we, you cannot turn the page on torture. For any of you who know the writing of Jean Amari, a Belgian um, you know, who was tortured by the Nazis, he said, whoever was tortured stays tortured. And I think that that's kind of the big lesson from Guantanamo. Anyway, I, I sorry, I covered a lot of stuff, but I'm happy to answer questions on anything. So thank you for your attention. He's as Hi. passionate as ever. Um, <laughs> nobody expects a Spanish Inquisition. Pardon me? Nobody expects oh, right. Spanish <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. But this is yours. We're going to have online questions and questions from the room, please. So we would like to start. Oh, is that me? Yes, no lady over uh, behind you, Gail. Yeah. 
Doesn't she need the mic? Yeah, unless you repeat the question. So they just take the. Oh, pardon. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for this very interesting and lively uh, presentation. Um, so I was wondering, you know, the war in Afghanistan has ended, but Guantanamo Bay is still open. And I was wondering why, and I think to some extent you have answered my question towards the end of your uh, presentation, is it because they don't know what to do with the remaining uh, detainees? And um, similar to this legal battle against torture that you have described, has there been a legal battle to challenge the legality of Guantanamo Bay itself? I mean, is it even legal to have that detention center? I mean, that. thank you. Those are very good questions. So just to um, whether or not, like, why isn't Guantanamo, if, if the war in Afghanistan, which was the first and last hot, you know, hot war, you know, uh, theater of the war on terror is over, although the United States is still waging 16 secret wars elsewhere, um, you know, but Guantanamo uh, is indeed open. And the reason Guantanamo is so difficult to close is because Americans, uh, you know, American politicians like are, have, you know, put themselves into this circumstance. So um, it is, you know, Congress, a bipartisan Democrats and Republicans, like in my book, I do not let Democrats off the hook at all. You know, I mean, I, I slam Republicans more, but I, you know, definitely all your Democrats, they passed um, legislation in 2010. This was like two years into Obama's term, prohibiting the transfer of anyone from Guantanamo or anybody who'd ever been in Guantanamo ever to come to the United States for any reason, including trial, including release, et cetera. And so to the extent that the United States still wants to prosecute people, there's no, they have, there's, you know, they have to, the Guantanamo can't close for that reason. But the other reason is that, you know, just sort of a larger level. I mean, Guantanamo, most Americans, honestly, I mean, even politically savvy people are not even actually aware that Guantanamo is still open. Like, oh, there's some people like Guantanamo. I mean, I, I've had Richard Falk was like, is Guantanamo still open? I was like, oh my God, you got to read Carol Rosenberg. But um, the, you know, it's because it's, it's this idea that um, it still occupies a kind of symbolic force. Like, you know, for example, uh, Trump, when he was running for office, you know, he was criticizing Barack Obama, who had tried at least to close or at least paid lip service to closing it. And Trump was like, I'm going to fill it up with a bunch of bad dudes. I mean, he couldn't actually do that, but you know, it's like, that's the kind of symbolic, like that, like Guantanamo is a means for people who are Islamophobic, racist, reactionaries to like attach their animus to us, like a, a, you know, a material thing, like a sim symbol like Guantanamo. Um, the other thing is in terms of just whether or not challenging um, whether Guantanamo is legal, I mean, in some ways that really was like the Rasul case was, you know, the idea that can the president hold people without charge or trial. So many, there have been many other fights since, I mean, like the, the habeas corpus itself has involved fights because, you know, the U.S. government does not speak, neither the courts nor the po politicians speak with one voice. And they don't even speak with two voices. They speak with 50 voices. And so it's a lot of cacophony. But, you know, this is one thing I sort of tell my students, you know, I'm a sociologist, not a lawyer, but it's like when something is enshrined in law, no matter how bad the law is, you can't just, you know, come along, and go, oh, that was bad. Let's just forget about it. You have to literally legislate away. So, so it's like a train. Like you literally have to build tracks of legislation to go if you want to direct the train in another direction. And that's a very a difficult thing given extreme partisanship and, and dissent, you know, um, you know, political dissent um, within the United States. So that's. Could I just pick up on something mm -hmm. that you maybe discussed to some extent? This idea of forever prisoners. Mm -hmm. Can you give us an idea of what that means and how, how, how are they kept there forever? Well, so Abu Zubaida was the, you know, and he's, I mean, there's two others um, as well. There would have been more, but, uh, you know, I think that ultimately there have been some weakening of decisions. But so Abu Zubaida is a guy, he was, you know, in Afghanistan, he was, um, he's actually of Palestinian origin, but he was like running you know, like a, you know, a training camp in the 1990s when, you know, the Northern Alliance and, and uh, the Taliban were fighting each other and et cetera. And so he was, you know, I mean, he was sort of like the receptionist 
you know, in a in like you know places where like so called Afghan Arabs who would come and fight the communists or fight whomever they were fighting. Um, and so when the so a lot of people when they first started arresting people in Afghanistan, Abu Zubaydah's name came up, like because you know people are being coercively interrogated, and then they're saying, Get, "Tell us names, give us names," because the Americans didn't know anybody. They didn't know anything. They're just like, tell us anything. So Abu Zubaydah's name came up a few times. And so in March of 2002, Abu Zubaydah is scooped up by the CIA and he becomes, so the American government, the Bush administration erroneously believed he was the number three person in Al-Qaeda. And so they take him off to a black site in Thailand. They hire these two contractor psychologists to develop the torture program. Um, and then they basically develop, use Abu Zubaydah to experiment on all the techniques that they're going to use. But ultimately, it was like Abu Zubaydah was not even a member of Al-Qaeda in you know 9-11. But because so many, the US, the, the CIA did so many things to him, and they can't prosecute because he's not guilty of what, you know, he's not, you know, so it's like he knows secrets and he's unprosecutable. And so that's why he's a forever prisoner. It's like, it's, it's pure shame and, you know, and, and like, you know, um, what's it called? The uh, stasis or like when, you know, uh, when things are frozen, mm -hmm. it's like, yeah. So it's like shame and what's the word I'm looking for? Stasis. Stasis. Okay. Yeah. Right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah, okay. uh, online, we have uh, one comment and one question, and I'll just read them out for you. So w Boris, first of all, wants to thank you for your amazing talk. And he says he really hopes that you continue these kind of book tours and continue talking about torture because there's not been anything like this uh, since the mass kind of WikiLeaks exposure. So like, so this is the- Buy my book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> he will. Uh, the uh, the one the one question was uh, that came in online was why can't the rest of the world put Bush and Obama on trial? Okay, so a whole stream of um, activity, uh, you know, probably starting around late two thousand four and really going to about two thousand seven. And even perhaps beyond that was efforts by some lawyers, also Center for Constitutional Rights, Michael Ratner and these guys teaming up, for example, with some European lawyers like Wolfgang Kalleck and the European Center for Civil and ECCHR for civil, you no know, constitutional, civil and human rights or something like that. Anyway, it's a couple of C's and an HR in there. Um, and so that's in, in now established in Berlin, kind of emulates CCR. They strived to pursue criminal cases using universal jurisdiction against Rumsfeld um, and you know Bush, others, um, you know, in courts in Germany, because Germany has excellent universal jurisdiction laws. Spain, there was an effort to actually go after the lawyers who legalized torture. In England, there was even you know, an effort, you know, but the problem was that um, you know, the United States, and this happened both the Bush administration at the time and then the Obama administration used diplomatic pressure to try and thwart these kind of cases that are allied countries, even if it was their own. And the, so it wasn't only going after US officials, but it was also then seeking justice in foreign courts for people who've been you know, tortured by the US. So even countries like under pressure for, you know, diplomatic pressure from the United States government would kind of abandon their own citizens and residents because the United States was putting all kinds of political pressure. I mean, you know, in this country, um, you know, seven, I believe it was seven, maybe more, uh, you know, were suing, they couldn't necessarily sue the US government, they sued M MI5, MI6, and a few other um, British organ intelligence agencies and government agencies for being collaborators in the torture program. This was when, um, what's the guy's name, who the prime minister, um, David, David, uh, pardon me? David Cameron? No, d d your prime minister, d David Cameron. Oh, okay, yes, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> no, that's a guy. <laughs> no, but I mean, so basically they were gonna sue the British government, you know, because frankly, abetting torture is as bad as perpetrating torture. And C Cameron then um, basically just didn't want, you know, and, and the, this is when Obama was in power. Obama, the Obama administration said, if you let information about 
CIA torture, because some of these guys had been tortured by the CIA, Binyam Mohammed and others, that, um, you know, that's going to, we're going to, you know, we're not going to be friends anymore. And so Cameron basically then decided to um, enter into a negotiated agreement. So I don't know if the amount is public, but then it was basically like people were paid a settlement to make the case uh, go away. So there's been those kind of cases, but none of the accountability cases in the United States, either seeking justice for people who'd been tortured by um, the US. There, there were efforts, a few people, Maher Arar is a Syrian, a Canadian of Syrian origin, tried to sue um, the, the officials who were responsible for his rendition to Syria. Um, Khaled al-Masri was a German, citizen who was like mistakenly, you know, uh, you know, kidnapped and tortured by the CIA and black sites. None of those cases, they, those cases just all collapsed because courts basically were like, we didn't see the, we, we never expected the inquisition. Like the courts were incapable of rising to the reality that had never been anticipated before that the US government tortured people as a matter of policy. And the courts were just like, I don't know, we don't, there's no precedent for this. And so the courts in those regards really, really failed. Okay, Lisa, I mean, you know, if we pick up on say one of the personalities involved on all this, it's John Yu, mm -hmm. who was, yeah, really bad things about the Geneva Conventions. Mm -hmm. He was a US constitutional lawyer. Yeah. Can he leave the United States or will he get arrested as soon as he leaves the territory? Well, that's actually a good question. So John Yu was after, so John Yu was actually a Berkeley, Univers University of California Berkeley law professor before he joined the Justice Department. He was in Justice Department from 2001 to 2003. And in 2003, after the torture memo that he'd written, one of the many torture memos he'd written became public, he went back to Berkeley. And he, I mean, Berkeley is supposedly like a liberal bastion of higher education. He was given one of the most distinguished named chairs at Berkeley, but he did want to go. He was going to take a sabbatical. He wasn't going to sabbatical at Caesars. He was going to go for sabbatical in Florence. And he had to cancel his plans. I think it was 2008 because th there were indictments yeah. waiting for him. So, yeah. There, I mean, it's possible. And that's the great thing about universal jurisdiction is like even I mean, even if you don't get people, it makes the powerful fearful. It makes them feel like they can't do things. I mean, Bush had to George Bush, after he was out of office, had to cancel a planned trip to Switzerland because there was an indictment waiting for him. Rumsfeld, after he was out of office, was in France and there was actually an indictment for him. And he like ran out of the country before it could be served. So there are these kind of initiatives. They haven't really produced what we want, which is like Dick Cheney and a maximum security um, you know, thing for the rest of his life. And John Yu, basically his um, shower Mate. But I think, you know, that other than that, it's like at least the fear and the possibility are, are I find, hopeful. <laughs> I suppose I've got to warn the people who are going into my class in all of armed conflict. John Hughes on the reading list. Lady of the very bike, please. Wait, wait. I'll come to you. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I guess I'm curious about. It appears that the United States government, they've been moving away from Guantanamo, but more towards um, intense prisons, like communications management units, where they have um, like more rigorous control on prisoners. And of course, like they have an insane concentration of people that they've claimed are terrorists from the Middle East or environmental activists. So um, I'm wondering if you think that regulation or um, ending Guantanamo, how you think that will um, change prisons in America and things like communications management units or um, tortures in prisons, or if you think it will just be some sort of transition away from the more obvious forms of torture to um, things that require that reform. Okay, so th that's a very good question, which I'll answer in two parts. One, U.S. prisons have been absolutely horrifying for decades. I mean, like Guantanamo doesn't have anything on uh, U.S. prisons except for the interrogation, uh, brutality, um, et cetera. But so in that sense, 
So that's one thing I would say like that. I don't see like it's not like U.S. prison administrators are being like, hmm, maybe we could learn some lessons from Guantanamo. They, they, they know everything about how to brutalize and, you know, uh, degrade, you know, prisoners. And but one of the things that really um, and this was something that often came up, especially in the early years of the war on terror, like I'm friends with lots of abolition, you know, prison abolitionists. And they were very frustrated that when Guantanamo starts getting attention, you know, and then we start learning in 2004 and five about the torture and people were saying, well, but, you know, there's that and worse going on in the U.S. prisons. And why isn't aren't people paying attention to U.S. prisons? Well, one of the things is that, um, you know, when you're like war is different than domestic politics. So it's, it opens up totally different, it, 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 it implicates different laws and it opens up different kinds of legal fights. But you know what, the, the end of the torture program and, and the kind of negative publicity that it had, this is, you know, when torture lost its, especially after the Hamdan decision and all the bad publicity, um, when, you know, it, it, because people, Americans, especially on the right. Like, I mean, there was like once Amer the, the general public learns that America, the government is torturing, support for torture goes up. So there was this like clamoring for more, you know, torture, but it had lost its appeal to the government. And so, it so in other words, capture, detention and interrogation are no longer appealing. What takes its place as a strategic cornerstone? Targeted killing. And so in the last year of Bush, you know, in, 19, in 2008, drone strikes escalate. They've only been sort of fairly minimal because the, in the first six years, the idea was we need information. We need to capture people live and interrogate them. Once, you know, ca capturing people live and interrogating them loses its appeal. And especially after Obama, who really, he cancels torture. People say, you know, Cheney comes out of the woodwork and says, so arresting and detaining people is really not on Obama's dance card because he knows that he can't withstand the right-wing pressure and he doesn't want to torture. So drone warfare, targeted killing, ex, you know, uh, intensifies exponentially. So that's one of the things I would say in the book is like one of the weird things was that like, you know, the success of the fight against torture, you know, in, in actually ending at least a torture program had the unexpected uh, consequence of escalating targeted killing as the new strategic alternative. Okay, Lisa, do you want to say a wee bit about targeted killing? Because I know you're an expert. <laughs> I mean, I have to have to like, read, you know, I was like, that was my, you know, that was a midlife, you know, sort of, <laughs> but, but targeted killing, you know, the thing about targeted killing, and I'll just say this about, you know, the, as much as Obama wanted to pose as, you know, the, the great liberal and the restorer of the rule of law, the very same logic, this, this new paradigm, this executive excess that, you know, had been really instituted and grounded during the Bush administration, the idea that the president's powers are unfettered, the courts and Congress shouldn't have a say, you know, Obama relied on that exact same logic for targeted killing. And so just as the Bush administration would say, anybody who we have in custody is a terrorist. Terrorists have no rights. We need information and everything we're doing is legal because our lawyer said so. The Obama administration was saying everybody we kill is a terrorist, you know, and so therefore, you know, so it's exact same logic. The only difference is killing versus capture and torture. Young lady in front. Hi, yeah. Thank you for that. That was absolutely fascinating. And this is well outside my research area. So this is an ignorant question. Please forgive me. No. Um, but you've spoken about this kind of success, I suppose, in closing Guantanamo. And I wondered what, it's also an unfairly large question, so I do apologize. Do you have any kind of suggestions for how to prevent something like this happening again, something like Guantanamo being set up in the US or somewhere else? What would be your... I mean, this is one of the great questions of, you know, I mean, it's, I, I think for anybody who's like studying humanitarianism and gross, you know, conflicts and things, you know, I mean, I don't have anything original to say, but it's like knowledge is absolutely crucial. Knowledge is a precursor to acknowledgement, if there's ever going to be acknowledgement. But the other thing is you look at, for example, like, you know, one of the things, I don't know for any of you who've ever read um, the work of Catherine Sicking, she has this book 2011 called The Justice Cascade, in which she looks at, she looks at, you know, sort of prosecutions of top officials 
for gross crimes, you know, and where it happened. And really, I mean, the Pinochet precedent was really a cutting edge thing, but there were other events and, and really Latin America in the, eight, in the late 80s and 1990s really stood out because it was a place where former, you know, people in the military dictatorship, both civilian and, um, and military, you know, after the dictatorship was over, after some time had passed, after their power and, and symbolic um, relevance, and, you know, a younger generation comes along, these people, you know, there was like a dozens and dozens of prosecutions of people from former regimes. So all of these things are important, like to, to probe and understand and disseminate knowledge about what happened, to hope and push that that knowledge actually translates into acknowledgement, but also, you know, to you know, even if people, I mean, you know, Henry Kissinger is still alive, you know, I'm like, so, you know, I've been like, you know, Henry Kissinger should have been, you know, uh, uh, you know, prosecuted years ago, but it's like, there's something to be said about, you know, to making a, like a, a case about it, because, I mean, you know, it's hard for me to say this because the United States is so fucked up right now. Like it's beyond, you know, it's like beyond. But one can hope that, you know, maybe 30 years from now, the next generations will, you know, not allow this kind of thing simply because there will be sufficient knowledge and information out there that this was an egregious mistake. This even by the standards of the government itself. Like Guantanamo was a failure on the very terms that it was selected. Torture was a failure for the very reasons, you know, ostensibly the only means to produce actionable intelligence, et cetera. It was a failure by its own terms. And so that kind of thing, I just, you know, I mean, you know, this is what an academic says, but I think it's, it's not, it's important to like, you know, produce knowledge, disseminate knowledge, and, you know, hope that that kind of a thing will, you know, have some reverberating effects. Yep, yep we've got two more questions that have come in online. Uh, one goes back to the idea of universal jurisdiction and wanted to know more about this. So Paul Tanto was asking who or what can initiate uh, a universal jurisdiction charge? Is it against individuals or is it against organizations? And the second question starts shifting towards state responsibility. So Deborah Holton was asking, is there any way to hold the United States accountable legally? Right. I mean, let me take the second question first. I mean, in principle, yes. But I mean, the sad thing is power politics and geopolitics being what they are, it's a lot easier to hold a weaker country, a weaker government, you know, uh, accountable or to hurt a weaker country than it is to hurt a very powerful country like the United States. And I mean, the fact that the United States, you know, you know the Biden administration, you know, like what's going on in the Ukraine is horrific. Horrific, but to have you know U.S. officials and I, you know, it's great. Like I mean, I'm like all for you know condemning what Russia is doing, et cetera. But it's like it, you know, the hypocrisy of like having American presidents like poo-pooing Russian torture. I mean, Russian torture is horrible, but like you know, I mean, <laughs> there's still people who are like living in a protracted torture situation in Guantanamo now. So it's like that thing is is bizarre. As far as universal jurisdiction goes, it's it, it attaches to individuals. I mean, it's an end of it's a it's it's a one it's called an international criminal uh, law jur, um, doctrine, and the doctrine is the idea that some crimes are so serious that their perpetrators are enemies of all mankind. And so the idea that foreign courts with no relationship to the victim, the perpetrator, or the crime itself can actually allow their own facilities to be used to pursue justice, the logic behind it is that, that those crimes must be punished. There should be no sanctuary and there should be no impunity for those crimes. And so therefore, if other countries can um, allow their courts uh, to be, or can use their own courts for that. It's, of course, it runs up against geopolitics as well. Like there's a brand new book by Reed Brody. He's like, you know, he had worked for Human Rights Watch for years and he's like, his nickname is the dictator hunter. And it's his book about like the hunting and prosecution of his son Habre of Chad. And like, that was also like a universal jurisdiction case. But there have been some universal jurisdiction cases uh, I mean, the thing that I like about your universal jurisdiction is that, you know, in principle, it's like it doesn't run through the United Nations. It's not subject to the same power politics as international courts and tribunals are. But 
it's still, you know, you do get like when the United States is playing, um, you know, using its diplomatic, throwing its diplomatic weight around, there is that thing. But it is, it's about, uh, you know, empowering individual governments, individual courts to, you know, basically prosecute cases in the name of humanity, in the name of justice, in the name of, you know, anti-impunity. Well, wait, hang on, hang on. Um, I'm just curious what you think would be the way in an ideal world, if like what you could have, if what you wanted to happen could happen, what would you think the best solution to prisoners such as Abu Zubaydah? Abu Ghraib? No, 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 sorry. Oh, Abu Zubaydah. Abu Zubaydah, yeah. Um, like what should happen to him like in an ideal world, like free him and give him like therapy, for instance? So yeah, I'm just curious what your opinion would well, be. I mean <laughs> That's a good question. I think he should basically be living in Dick Cheney's house and Dick Cheney should be living in a maximum supermax. Um, you know, like that's what I think. But I mean, you know, Abu Zubaydah, I mean, the problem is like, I mean, Abu Zubaydah should be released. Although where can he go? I mean, it's like he embodies state secrets, shameful, shameful state secrets. And so like, that's kind of one of the things. So um, one of his, like, so one of the first lawyers who started the Rasul v. Bush was Joe Margulis. Joe Margulis still represents Abu Zubaydah. You know, he's his habeas, and Abu Zubaydah's never even had a habeas hearing because, you know, the, you know, the, well, I mean, it would be the Obama administration, the Trump administration, and the Biden administration don't want to enable a court to really hear what happened to Abu Zubaydah and, and you know what the government, all the mistakes the government made. So it's just, you know, I mean, it's this is one of those things where there will, there's no that, I mean, even if it's just him, you know, they have that saying like let a hundred men, guilty men go free rather than to convict an innocent man. Like this is, I mean, you know, this is one of those things where you just like this is like there's no getting around the fact that this is just a horrific tragedy for which there, I mean, there could be a solution if America was a different country, you know, if, if Americans were totally different people, but they're not, they're just what they are. And so there's no solution to this thing. So, sorry. Dale? There's another question online from Hannah, who she was interested in your mapping from the shift of torture to targeted um, killings. And so her question was, asked, well, it was to ask, is this the end of torture then? Uh, is this now the end of torture? And is are we seeing the end of torture uh, because it's illegal or because there was media and societal uh, pressure and the, the per perceptions of it in media that led to the, the recognition of the illegality of torture? Excellent question. I mean, so the CIA, you know, uh, happily, you know, George W. Bush, it was days after 9-11 when this, when the Bush, when President Bush decides the CIA, you know, which is actually a civilian agency, but it operates in total secrecy. There's no accountability for the CIA. Bush wanted the CIA to be the tip of the spear in the war on terror. And the CIA was happy to play that role because it was like, you know, prestigious, even though everything they were doing was secret. And so, you know, the CIA basically goes along and, and I, in fact, you know, takes, you know, drives the, you know, the torture car. But once it was exposed, the torture program was exposed, even though the CIA still thinks that the critiques of the CIA are unfair and mean, they don't sound mean to the CIA, but it's like they learned their lesson, you know, right? Because when Donald Trump ran for president in 2016, like every, not only him, but every single Republican candidate who were running in the primaries, like who's gonna actually be the Republican to get the Republican nomination. Every single one of them, 12 of them, all wanted to bring back enhanced interrogation. Like they were like nostalgic for torture. So they wanted to bring back enhanced interrogation, but Trump was the most um, vociferous and least euphemistic. He wanted to bring back the waterboard. But even his, the, the Democratic candidate, Hillary Clinton, she was not anti-torture. She basically, her position was, well, if there's ever a circumstance when we need to engage in torture, I'll take responsibility for it. I'll, I'll do it, but I'll, I'll, I won't hide it, I'll, I'll, whatever. So it's like, you know, so, but the CIA, when Bush, when, when, when Trump won, 
one of his top, the days after the 2016 election, he said one of his top five priorities was to bring back the water board. And the CIA was like, yeah, I don't think so. And so like they were basically like, we're not going back there again. We, we've learned our lesson. Now, the CIA people currently, they're going to die someday of old age, but like will the next generation? I mean, you think that, I mean, the CIA basically um, has never had any success. I mean, CIA is just one monkey show of like crap there's there's never been anything the cia has ever done that didn't ultimately turn into a complete shit show but they have no successes at all ever from the time they were established in the early 1950s so you know you think that they might learn a lesson to be like okay well let's at least not try to be that kind of assholes again so i don't know you know it's like there are these institutional factors and i do think that the military which was really pushed by civilians in the Pentagon to like, you know, when Rumsfeld authorized torture, the military learned its lesson a lot quicker. And so they, I think, I mean, the same way that the Vietnam War, the lessons learned from the Vietnam War caused the US military to reform and improve on military doctrine in, after the seventies, you know, not that it's perfect, but I feel like the, the lessons from the war on terror are also lessons that the military once again will internalize because it was very much those post-Vietnam uh, reforms that Cheney and Rumsfeld wanted to undo. And so they did undo them. And then, then the military has to go and re-reform themselves. So I think that that happened again. And so there is this kind of institutional uh, lessons that might be learned. Okay. Yeah, let's go. Uh, Wait. Uh, Obviously, one of um, the Obama administration's biggest um, sort of criticisms was the Guantanamo failure to shut down Guantanamo. But I wanted to ask you if you thought that this was due to political reasons. For example, if Obama didn't want to divide the public and the government more than they already were when he came into power, or do you think there's something else behind the reason he didn't? do more to prevent more of this happening. Right. I mean, you know, whenever I give talks in the United States, I'm always like, oh, it was so Obama. People are like, what do you mean? But it's like, I mean, Obama is like just, you know, he, you know, he had talked a good game when he was running for office. And then he, you know, ends the torture program on the second day in office. Cheney comes out, starts saying mean things about him and on Fox News. He's like, he, he had this fantasy that he could be the post-partisan healer. And there was that, there was not going to be any of that. I mean, not only because, for anything related to torture, he's black, you know, the Tea Party emerges, I mean, all the latent, you know, not so latent racism in America. And so he concedes early on, he basically had this facile line, when people like the ACLU and other organizations were saying, let's prosecute these people who perpetrated the grossest of gross crimes. And he was like, oh, it's time to look forward, not backward. Well, it's like, you know, why don't you say that, you know, if you ever get picked up for speeding, oh, why don't we look forward, not backward? I'm not speeding now. Like, I, you know, the speeding is in the past. Let's not, you know, give me a ticket. But it's like, I mean, it's like, it's that stupid, except for with a, you know, gross, the grossest of gross crimes. And, but it was very much him fantasizing that he could somehow heal a nation with his rhetoric. And so, but in the end, I mean, the other things that Obama did that I, you know, characterize as his original sins was he appointed this really odious guy as his chief of staff named Rahm Emanuel. He appointed, you know, a guy who had been the, um, the, the deputy director of the CIA, John Brennan, becomes the White House counterterrorism advisor and basically is like, don't do anything to make the CIA look bad. And he kept Bush's secretary of defense, Robert Gates. And Gates was fundamentally opposed to closing Guantanamo. So Obama talks a good game and then he puts three stooges into power and, and wonders why nothing can get done. You know. Anybody else? Yes. Um, right. Oh, sorry. It's just because um, you talked about how, um, um, let's say, the next generation could maybe bring about a change to what we see in Gu uh, Guantanamo Bay. But I was just thinking, can the courts, even though they might be unsuccessful, is there no legal avenue that they could use to still bring, how can I say, attention to the current issue? Let's say with the forever prisoners. Mm -hmm. I understand that, oh, they, that they cannot be prosecuted because right. they have committed no crimes. Mm -hmm. But the fact that they are still, well, let's say, withheld, that is still grounds for lawyers to bring it, to bring a, a attention to, let's say, uh, mm -hmm. uh, to the court. And 
maybe attract more international attention to that as well Mm because that is something that I was completely unaware of even having done let's say previous research uh before coming in here these are things that need to be how how can I say uh, explicited more uh put forward yeah so so I mean that's a very good question you know again like courts are only semi-autonomous right there's the idea that the judicial impartiality but courts are you know part of a fabric that's composed of political the things that if you know anything about U.S. courts now, they're very deeply politicized. But so with the case of Abu Zubaydah specifically, one of the countries where he was, you know, one of the countries that the CIA had black sites where he was tortured was Poland. Like the three European countries were Poland, Romania, and um, Lithuania. And so the so the so Joe Margulis, his lawyer, and other you know lawyers who are working on this case, they basically they figured they can't get much any justice for Abu Zubaydah in the United States, but they wanted they basically wanted the Polish government, you know, to fulfill its own European responsibility to hold Polish officials accountable, who had allowed the CIA to set up a black site on Polish territory. And so Poland was actually willing to do that. They were they started an investigation of Polish security officials. And then they said, you know, there's this thing that countries that are allied with each other are supposed to help each other with legal processes. So the Polish government asked the US government, could we have some information from the CIA about what our guys did? You know, and the government and the US government was like, nope, nothing. It's it's a secret. So then Margulis sued, you know, I mean, they wanted to bring the, the the architects of the torture program, these two contractors, and the two contractors were willing to testify in Poland, or, or at least, you know, give um, affidavits what they did to Abu Zubaydah in Poland. And the government, Trump administration, and then the Biden administration basically were like, no, they can't, they can't talk. And so that case went to the Supreme Court and just I think it was just last, I can't remember. I mean, I, this is really one of the things I end the, the very last thing of the book, but you know, oh, the, the majority of the Supreme Court basically sided with the government and said, if the government says state secrets are gonna be released, if, if these two contractors talk about what they did to Abu Zubaydah back in 2003, you know, um, we are gonna, you know, the America is gonna fall apart and everything will, you know, happen. And so, they want you know like the, the the court and this was like a you know it wasn't just the right wing justice it was actually split and that paradoxically the dissent the dissent in that decision was one of the most right wing supreme court justices leo leo uh, Le, um what's his name gorsuch what's his first name uh whatever gorsuch and sonia sotomayor those two she's like the left and he's like a hard right and they came together and what what gorsuch said in in his dissenting opinion was we cannot pretend as judges not to know what we know as citizens. And then he goes on and says, there is no real reason that you know these guys shouldn't be able to testify other than the fact that the government is just embarrassed. There is no, there are no secrets that are going to be spilled by this kind of a thing. So it's like, but it still is, you know, the government will operate as though you know, you know, the secrets are, must be protected. And in this case, in particular, when you think about the role the CIA has said, the CIA around these issues drives the government. The, the one administration after another, Democrat or Republican, um, Congress, and the courts. You know, the CIA basically says what's secret, and then the government goes along with it. So it's basically the CIA is the dog, and the everything else is the tail that gets wagged around. So the CIA basically runs the country and these kinds of issues, at least. Okay. Anybody else in the room? Gail? Oh. Sorry? There's one question here if you have time. Oh, sorry, yeah. I, I, okay. I didn't see your hand. Yeah, so just a really quick question. I, I'm really interested in what you said about um, targeted killings and thinking back to shoot to kill in Northern Ireland. And I guess my question is, if that is now the policy, um, how do lawyers, how do sociologists interact with that in terms of how do you do something about that? Because they are dead. I mean, that's a much... Are you talking about targeted killing? That... Yeah. Okay. Tar- yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I guess that's a greater, or I don't know, depends how you feel about it, but greater infringement on your human rights. But how do you actually interact with that if the person is dead? And is that just is that just an ironclad way of dealing with what the CIA wants to deal with? Well, I mean, that's an excellent question. So basically, I mean, this is really sort of how I open 
you know, the, the book, it like sort of the prologue was like when, when Osama bin Laden was tracked down in uh, Pakistan and then killed on May 1st, 2011, why was he killed? Why wasn't he captured and brought here? Well, because Obama was president. And if Osama bin Laden was taken alive, there would have been a fury to torture the hell out of him by all the people who were upset that the, you know, the torch program had been gone. And so, I mean, just to use that very vivid example was like Osama bin Laden had to be killed. You know, but I mean, Osama bin Laden is a very, just for other kind of reasons, but all the thousands of people who were killed by drone warfare, whether they were known, that's called personality strikes when the government, like when surveillance drones actually know who they're bombing, they're like, oh, that's, you know, whomever. But then they also had signature strikes, like people who look like terrorists, people who are acting like terrorists, and they're killed, you know, for that reason, like because there's all kinds of like, you know, adjuncts. But the, the part of this, the logic of that, you know, so there were a few cases, like some of the same lawyers who had been involved in the fight against torture did try to um, pursue cases against the targeted killing program. Like, for example, when Anwar al um, you know, who was an American who, a uh, cleric who was uh, killed in Yemen, but when his 16 year old son was killed like a week later and the US government was like, oh, he was a 21 year old militant. And then the grandfather's like, he was 16, he was killed, whatever. And then the case shut down, but killing because it really, even like this kind of, you know, drone warfare, because killing, first of all, drone warfare is much more diffuse, like in terms of who's involved than, you know, interrogation, uh, et cetera. But the other thing is like, you know, the government would claim this is an act of war and courts are loath to make, you know, kind of hot war calls on the government. They're basically just can see that those are, those are political questions. And so it was, you know, none of the targeted killing cases got any traction whatsoever. And so it was this idea that the, um, you know, it's, I mean, it's the same kind, as I said before, Obama was relying on the same kind of logic as Bush had, you know, the Bush administration established, everybody we kill is guilty. But it was also, I mean, it really was this kind of, you know, like people talk about like American exceptionalism, but it's like the hubris, like we're going to kill people and the people we kill deserve to die. And then, you know, when people, when then human rights organizations and foreign, uh, you know, investigative journalists would basically say, no, as a matter of fact, you killed like a, uh, like a wedding, you, you bombed a wedding. It's like, you know, there's that incapacity to deal. I mean, it's like, it's just, it's a real, you know, um, uh, gap. But I think, again, it's like the, the government probably realized that there's blowback. As if, you know, the like United States hasn't had like 800 instances of blowback in the past, but it was like this blowback actually was not keeping the United States safe. I mean, the whole targeted killing policy is like, you know, that game they have at fairs where it's like whack-a-mole, you know, it's like, this is like whack-a-mole. If you kill one, hey, we're, you know, we're safer now. Oops, like three more pop up, bing. It's like, it's just ridiculous. You know, and U.S. military policy, especially around target killing, was based on hubris and nonsense and lies. Hubris, nonsense, and lies. Yeah. I think we've got time for hopefully one last question from someone online who was asking if there are any books or studies that are, is, that are, studies that are done on the type of conditioning um, for those that have gone through torture in Guantanamo Bay. Yes, there's a load of stuff, but... Um, I mean, there's, I mean, there's absolutely, I'm, yeah, I mean, have the, like, I would just say that there's, you know, reading critical accounts of, I'll, let me say, look, one book that is worth, um, it's, it's written by Mark Fallon, F-A-L-L-O-N, and it's called Unjustifiable Means. He was a member of NCIS, National Criminal Investigative Services, and he was at Guantanamo early on and started seeing what was going on, and he's been very active in the fight against torture. So he's, that book is one, you know, good one about sort of like thinking about the means themselves, but there's a, there's a load of, uh, of of books. I mean, I like again. My book is from, probably has some of that in the bibli in the um in the selected reading at the back. But there's just a ton of books. So yeah, it's a it's a it's a very large you know fruitful literature. So okay. Well, anyway, thank you all very much for paying some time for all this uh, giving me all this time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah.